Welcome to Second Tech, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Transnet has unveiled a recovery plan that is heavily reliant on government financial support. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the details. Hi Terence. Hi oh, Chanel. What is the background to this recovery strategy? Well, I think the, the broader background is a, a very intense period of state capture uh, at the freight logistics utility over many years. And uh, basically that has seen that we had a, a sort of a, a utility that was in fairly good financial position. It always prided on itself on not having to go with a begging bowl to government and was on a continual, at one stage, seemed to be on a, a growth trajectory. I mean, it can be disputed whether that was, uh, whether the performance was as good as it was, seemed to be, but there was a period where it, f it was a fairly stable state-owned enterprise. But uh, the post that very intense period, which was epitomized by the 1064 locomotive contract, which was eventually declared illegal and was a major focus of the Zondo Commission, those contracts were declared illegal. Uh, there was a, a, a stalemate in terms of the delivery of locomotives which were needed, particularly on certain corridors. The coal corridor needs electrified locomotives. And really we've seen the performance collapse um, massively over the last six years. So volume collapse uh, really about over 77, around 77 million uh, tons of volume collapse across the rail system. And that's what we see every day with this rise of the, the road on the road, hauliers on our highways, everywhere you drive now, at certain border posts, at certain ports, you just have this uh, gridlock of trucks. And that's basically a, a reflection of the the decline in the rail system, actually the collapse in the rail system, especially certain corridors. I um, mean, the, the, the Durban to Johannesburg corridor has been in, I suppose, in chronic loss-making position and volume declined for many, many years. Um, but it's accelerated during this period. Then we had the COVID uh, a period where basically things ground to a halt around uh, Transnet. It took them quite a long time to start getting back uh, up and running. So we had a, a, a clean-up led by a board, a new board, and a new executive team. But that executive team, in terms of getting the operations stabilized, and then on a growth trajectory, failed. So we've had a, a slew of resignations out of Transnet in, in the recent months. And now the new board is in place, and really the background is over the last 100 days of the board is understanding what is the position that Transnet is in and how do we get out of this position. And then they've announced after that 100 days this recovery plan with an interim executive management team to, to lead it. What are some of the key components? So the main thing is to try to get volumes back up. Um, so, you know, that's, it fell to a really low level last year of about 149 million tonnes railed. And the stretch target for this year is 170 million tonnes. And the so-called doable target, which they, they're saying is the minimum they need to do this year is 154 million tonnes, um, which will require quite an effort on its own because uh, the first half wasn't half of that. So uh, that, it's a really, it's a, it's a throughput story. It's about getting um, volumes back onto a rail, getting locomotives working again, We've got a lot of idle locomotives linked to what I was saying earlier, to the lack of a settlement, particularly with the Chinese supplier uh, of the locomotives. And they, they are not actually including any recovery linked to getting any of those Chinese locomotives back into the system. So we've got over 300 locomotives standing idle because of parts not being there, not being able to repair, and then the new fleet not being replenished as was expected when the, the contracts were placed. So that's, that's a big part, a big component is the, the volumes. And then also, you know, dedicating railways, rolling stock, port equipment to the higher margin business, because we know that Transnet has now slumped into a, a last year 5.7 billion rand loss position. And it would have been similar the year before had, had it not been bailed out from a sort of a uh, a revaluation of its property portfolio. So it's really uh, in a poor financial state and its revenue has been on the decline for the last six years and its costs have been rising. So it's in a sort of a, a terrible squeeze 
uh, and it, it's all uh, coming together. And then its debt burden has uh, swelled to, uh, to 130 billion rand and its interest payments to a billion rand a month. So 13 billion rand over the year. So financially, there's also uh, a, a big focus on trying to, you know, put the equipment in where they're going to get the, the best returns. And then the other two, com or the other component is is really to bring in private sector participation. And now we know it's been uh, the the big ticket there has been the uh, Durban Container uh, Terminal Pier Two, where they found a partner that is still going through a due diligence phase, but that's an important signal of the sort of thing that they're going to do. And then as part of this phase of the recovery on the railway network, there's a vertical separation underway in the Transnet Freight Rail Group. So it's always been a vertically integrated monopoly where both the lines and the operations have been dominated by one entity. There's been a separation internally of the operation, so we've got a new TR. FOC operating company and we've got a TRIM which is the infrastructure manager, manager and that separation should be in place internally by the end of the month and that is in preparation for this much spoken about third party access. Now we've had a massive false start around that under the previous leadership there was an attempt to bring third parties on through a sort of a two year slot sale which was far too short, particularly in a context where there was no rolling stock to lease. So it, it fell flat and the last, the only preferred bidder that was named eventually exited the, that process this week or, or last week. So that, that has fallen flat in favor of a much more even playing field where the, uh, and we're gonna have to see it in practice, but theoretically we'll have the infrastructure manager being uh, much more independent from the operations and those who are competent, not only Transnet Freight Rail, but others will be able to take over some of those slots. And that should be all up and running from April next year. Obviously it will be a, a slow uptake, there will have to be investment, but I think that, that bringing in that competition onto the tracks uh, is an important part of the recovery story for rail in South Africa. Might not help uh, Transnet immediately, um, from a volume perspective, they have to focus on getting their rolling stock moving and uh, their infrastructure in place to allow that on those key corridors. But over time, from a South Africa perspective, I think this is vital. We've had uh, too many eggs in a basket, uh, in one basket that has not been performing. And I think having other players on this, uh, on this infrastructure is going to be important so long as the infrastructure is well maintained and is not vandalized and is, is not, and cable theft is brought under control and that is a big if but i think ultimately having multiple players on the tracks uh, multiple rolling stock company or train operators on the tracks should start seeing a recovery uh, in volumes uh, whether it will ever displace what we've seen on certain uh, key trade corridors trade routes in south africa the tracks which have been really competitive and it basically bailed us out from a national perspective in terms of keeping us um, you know, with, with the goods that we, we require as a country that relies on imports and also to allow us to export. It will be, uh, we'll have to wait and see. So it's not really, we're not there where we can say we've got a real <laughs> road to rail strategy in place. Uh, from a volume perspective, I think the volumes are still gonna be under pressure from road for some time. But these are some of the components that are in the recovery plan. Do you think Transnet will receive the financial support it wants from government? Well, that's going to be <coughs> the big question now because right from the start, the chairperson of Transnet, Andira Sankru, made it clear that they need this capital injection. So he said it at the annual results presentation in September and was battered away quite firmly, I felt, by the uh, Public Enterprises Minister Pravin Gordon said get your operations working and get the throughput up and you'll get the finance you need and yes that's a, that is important it's a throughput business and they show that as they get the volumes the finances, finances do recover but the, the position that they're in of this, this debt position they've got, they've got themselves into and the recovery plan requires some funding they are basically saying without 
the debt relief that they're looking for, and they're looking for sort of a 60 billion of that debt relief and another 47 billion capital injection. They're saying without that, this plan is not workable, and they believe this plan can work if they get the funding. Now, as put upon South African taxpayers, our eyebrows are raised yet again. We've just had a 354 billion support package debt relief for Eskom. Uh, in the February budget and now next week we've got the medium term budget policy statement and uh, the Finance Minister Ina Gondwana has to now mull over this. Yes, there is a case, I think they have put forward a fairly credible case in terms of how they can recover, but it's a big ask in a context where the fiscal imbalance has really worsened. Um, so we were bailed out just post COVID by that sort of windfall from the commodity exports. But um, those, the prices are weakened. The tax intake is not what we were expecting in February. So we'll know next week sort of what the gap is. Hopefully it's not as massive as the fear was, but as yet there's, there's still going to be a gap. We're still underwater in terms of that. There are massive other needs <laughs> in the system, social needs. So this would be, this is a big ask, 100 billion rand plus package at a time when the fiscal uh, f fiscus is under huge stress and there are huge demands. So I don't think it's a given, but I think that uh, given what, uh, what happened with Eskom, I think that, uh, and, and given I think the sort of um, confidence that, that seems to be in place around this new board, and even though it's an interim team, you know, there has been a bit of a clean out at the top of Transnet. They've put their best foot forward in terms of the plan. Um, whether they get everything they want, I, I have my doubts, but we'll have to wait and see. But uh, the fact that they've, they've hitched <laughs> that wagon to the bailout uh, is somewhat problematic because you know, you've put the finance minister and the government in a very precarious position. But on the other hand, they are the 100% shareholder. They don't want privatization. If you don't want privatization and you're the shareholder, then you have to find the money to capitalise a business that requires capital and is in distress. The only other option is to sell some of the business or to, and to privatise, which as we enter election season, I think they don't want to do. So they're between a rock and a hard place. So they've got a policy position that makes it hard to sell anything other than non-core. And the non-core is quite marginal. It's properties, it's scrap. You know, it's some of the rolling stock that is not being in use. That's n it's not a, a major core part of the business, not the port operations. Yes, they bring in private sector participation, but that's not privatisation. So if you're wanting to hold that line and you're wanting to sustain the state of the shareholder and the a credible board and management team is giving you a plan that requires the shareholder to respond, well, <laughs> you have to make a decision. And I think that decision may be made. We may have some insight into it next week in the medium-term budget policy statement, but we might not have the full picture after that statement. We may have to wait till February. Thank you. That's the second tax show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.